from Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Hi there, Johnny. This is Buster. Buster? Buster Favor, Lake Mojave Resort over on the Colorado River. Oh, well, Buster, how are things? Oh, you never really did get in the fishing we promised you over here. No, but so help me, I'm going to one of these days. Is that what you call me about? No. Johnny, you remember old Mike Kirby? Kirby, Kirby. Oh, sure. The sweet old fellow I met down at your boat dock. A uh, guide or something? That's the one. Oh, sure, I remember him. How is he? Well, that's what I'm calling about. He, uh, he isn't. What? And Johnny, I think it was murder. <laughs> Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Tri-State Life and Casualty Insurance Company Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Kirby Will matter. As soon as I hung up on Buster, I lost no time in making the necessary plane reservation to Las Vegas and picking up a handful of American Express traveler's checks. That's item one on the expense account, a total of $320. Then I packed a bag, was about to take off, and the phone rang again. Johnny Dollar. Oh, Johnny, I'm glad I caught you in. It's Danny Newcomb at Tri-State Life and Casualty. Oh, hi, Danny. Johnny, I need you badly, and I need Whoops. you fast. Now, there's only a $5,000 policy involved. Danny. The circumstances are I'm sorry, you... Dan, but I can't handle it. I'm about to catch a plane out no, of no, here. No, no, Johnny, now listen. There may be a killing involved in this case, so we don't dare waste any time. And what's No, no, you we... listen. There may be a killing involved in what I'm going out What's to... more, the death of our client occurred at one of your old stamping grounds. Sorry, at Dan. At the Lake Mojave Resort. Danny, I told you I... What? That's right. You... Mike Kirby? Yeah. Okay, Danny, I'm on my way. It was 7.30 a.m. when the plane dropped me off in Las Vegas, Nevada, smack in the middle of the Mojave Desert. Even at that hour of the morning, the otherwise clear, clean air was filled with the cacophony of the city of chance. The stuttering clicks of the ball on the roulette wheels, the rattle and gallop of the ivories on the dice table, the endless drone of the croupier, the flat clank of the chuckaluck cages, the snap of cards by the blackjack dealers, the never-ending click of poker chips and silver dollars. And over it all, the interminable chunk and whir of the slot machines, day and night from one end of the town to the other. Fabulous. I grabbed breakfast, that's item two, then rented a car and headed south and east on Route 93 toward Kingman, Arizona. Then, just five miles short of that town, I swung right on 68 down toward Davis Dam, down to Lake Mojave Resort. Mile after mile of nothing but sun-baked rock and sand, sagebrush and Joshua trees, tumbleweed and cactus. And right in the middle of it, the clear blue waters of Lake Mojave. Buster Favor, whose general factotum of the resort, was waiting for me. After a hearty greeting, he led me into the office, and we sat down and got to work. Yeah, it was murder, all right, Johnny. Are you sure? Yeah. And by the way, I don't know how much you knew about Mike Kirby. Well, only that he seemed to be one of the fixtures around here. Was obviously well-liked. Well, he'd been a businessman back east. Owned a string of restaurants, made a fortune. Uh Uh-huh. And about ten years ago, he retired. Did a lot of traveling all over the world, I guess. Oh, lucky man. Did he have any relatives, Buster? Oh, only some nephews and nieces. I see. Anyhow, a little over three years ago, he settled down here to spend the rest of his life just fishing, taking it easy. Can't think of a better place or way to retire. How old was he, Buster? Sixty-one. Didn't look it, though. No. Well, if I remember right, he was pretty fit. Mm, he was. Well, I had the impression when I was here before that he was just a hired fishing guy, something like that. Oh, he used that as an excuse to meet folks. Half the time, he clean forgot to charge for his guide services. Accidentally on purpose, no doubt. Well, now you said... Now, don't rush me, Johnny. I got to give you the background. Okay, sure. He kept saying over and over and over again how glad he was to be out from under a lot of responsibilities. 
And one day, about six or seven months ago, he suddenly transferred title to his boat, his motor, his fishing tackle, and his old beat-up Ford to us. Oh. I know. I asked him at the time. If he wanted to get him off his personal inventory, why not give him to his relatives? Well, what'd he say to that? He said he didn't like them. Felt they were just waiting around for him to die so they could get their hands on his money. Oh. That he just wanted to make sure that if anything happened to him, the stuff would end up with us on account of we'd use it and appreciate it. Also, Johnny, he plunked down $10,000 in cash and insisted that we take that, too. Ten thousand? What for? His rent on his cabin for as long as he lived. Oh. Buster, did he leave a will of any kind? Well, now I'm getting to that. Anyhow, last Friday afternoon, he went out fishing alone like he often did. And just before dark, one of the rental boats came in with two young kids. They'd seen old Mike's boat up on the beach in that big cove just above the power line crossing. They found Mike laying on the sand beside it as still as death. Well, they came tearing in to report it, scared half out of their wits. Well, I sure hope you... Oh, sure, sure. I grabbed Ham Pratt and a big flashlight. You remember Ham. Oh, yeah, the manager of the resort. Yeah, yeah. Well? Well, we... We found him there. And he... He was gone. Poor old fella. Go on, Buster. Well, Ham took one look at him and... Rattlesnake, he said. Rattlesnake did it. Mm -hmm. You could tell by the way Mike looked laying there. Fang marks? Yeah, on his right leg, just above the ankle. And a big bruise on his head, like he'd hit a rock when he fell. But on the phone, you said you thought it was murder. And a minute ago, you said you're sure of it. Well, we put him in our boat, hitched his on behind, and brought him back here. We phoned Tad Harding of the Kingman Police Department. Oh, I remember him. Good man. Yeah, well, Chief Harding took one look and he agreed with Ham. Poison from a rattler. Well, they took him into Kingman and I telegraphed the relatives. But, Buster, now look, you... Then I got to thinking. There was something wrong. What do you mean? Well, there are very few rattlers in this part of the country because of the heat. They can't take it. If anybody would know better than to fool with one, it'd be old Mike. And they always sound a warning before they strike anyhow, don't sure, they? Sure, sure. So early the next morning, I went back to the cove. And? Number one, there was no sign of any rock that Mike might have hit his head on when he fell. Go on, Buster, go on. There was no trail from any kind of a snake anywhere around. Well, the sand could have drifted over them. No, sir. The footprints Ham and I and the kids had made were clear as crystal, but no tracks of a snake. All right, go on. Well, then I noticed it. Where another boat had been beached. Strange one, not from our landing. It was right next to where Mike's had been, right alongside. Any footprints from it? Well, if there were, we and the kids had mashed them all out. And I remember the way Mike had been laying there, as though he could have been rolled out of his boat or thrown out right on the sand. Then it looks as though somebody met him out on the lake, banged him over the head, made the fang marks, which isn't hard, then lashed the two boats together, dumped him off at the cove and left. It sure does, Johnny. I want to see that place. Yeah, and all the excitement, I might have overlooked a lot of things. Oh, that I doubt. Now, Buster, if there's no sign of rattlesnake poison in all Mike's body... Well, right after I called you, I phoned Chief Harding. Coroner's making his autopsy today. He'll call me. Well, now, look. These nephews and nieces of Mike's, how much do you know about them? Oh, I never met them. But according to their answering telegrams, they're going to descend on us like a swarm of locusts. There are a lot of them? Well, no. I was thinking of the way that they... Well, one, there's a woman name of Martha Woodbury who... Excuse me. Mr. Faber? Yeah, I'm Buster Faber. I am Miss Martha Woodbury. Oh, well, Miss Woodbury, we were just at... Uh... Uh, this is Mr. Johnny Dollar, Miss... How do you do? Mr. Faber, I'm a niece of Michael Jonathan Kirby, and probably the major beneficiary of his estate. I wired you that I would be here, and I am. You got here kind of fast, too, didn't you? I also wired Uncle Michael's attorney in Kingman that I saw no reason why I should delay the reading of Uncle Michael's will. Lawyer Guilford phoned me about that, and I guess you weren't the only one. You should be here late this afternoon. I also wish to make funeral arrangements, befitting one of his financial status. Uh, won't you sit down? Now, please tell me the circumstances of his death. And, of course, I wish to see the old, the poor darling's body. Miss Woodbury. Oh, uh, yes? What do you do for a living? Why, if it's of any concern to you, I teach at Armand College. Toxicology. Toxicology, huh? Yes. Well, isn't very interesting. Is it? Why? Who are you, Mr. Dollar? Well, I'm a special investigator for your uncle's insurance company. What? Yes, you see, we have good reason to believe your uncle was murdered. Murdered? Murdered? Who said that? 
Oh. Hello, Martha. Uh, you said murdered. Are you talking about Uncle Michael? Well, that's right. Who are you? I am Chester Kirby, and as far as I know, the heir to my uncle's fortune. Oh. Who are you, sir? Uh, Chester, Mr. Dollar is an insurance investigator. Oh, an investigator, huh? Dollar, I'm Hank Kirby, family black sheep, also Uncle Mike's nephew. What's his talk about murder? Are, uh, are you three his only relatives? That's right, Dollar, except for Lita. Lita? Low Lita Laverne. So we sometimes try to forget that. Oh, come off of that. Why, Miss Woodbury? My sister is a cheap nightclub dancer. We prefer to forget it. And the silly stage name she uses. Now, take it easy, teacher. Of course, Martha. This is hardly the time or place to... What do you do for a living, Mr. Kirby? Chester? Oh, uh, well, play the stock market a bit, that sort of thing. He's a playboy, Mr. Dollar, and a gambler, and I suspect not a very honest one. Martha, my dear girl, I resent that. You've never done a lick of honest work in your life. And if you think Uncle Michael didn't know it, would let his money ever get into those soft, pickpocket fingers of yours? You don't think you're the well, one Well, let me it. tell you something, Oh, shut up, sir. both of you. Pair of money grabbing. If you had to work for a living... You... Like what, Hank? What do you do? Yes. Tell him, Henry. Oh, I told you I was the black sheep of the family, but I work. You know, odd job. I'll tell you, Mr. Dollar. He's a roustabout. Circuses. Carnival, that disgusting sort of thing. Where are you working now, Hank? Well, there's a sort of a scientific exhibit. Side uh, show is more like it. All right, all right. Along the highway over near Victorville. A lot of rare animals, reptiles, and things on display. And Henry, dear boy, when he's off the bottle, is appropriately enough in charge of the snake pit. Oh. Uh. Well, we do scientific work, too. You, you know, like, uh, well, like, uh... Like, uh, what, Henry? Like milking the venom from the snakes to sell to laboratories? Yeah. Oh, that is would. Excuse me. Hello? What? You sure? Well, what... Mr. Dollar, oh, I think it's about time you tell us hey, what you Listen meant when... Yeah, Buster. I want you to hear this. It's Chief Harding. Go ahead, Chief. Well, as I said, Buster, there was evidence of rattlesnake venom in the body, all right. But it didn't enter at the fang marks on the leg. What, what do you mean, Chief? Well, the coroner says those marks were fakes. The venom was injected with a needle up near the armpit where it wouldn't be noticed. Chief, this is Johnny Dollar. Oh, hi there, Mr. Dollar. Haven't seen you since you were out here Listen, working on the... Listen, was the venom injected into his body before or after old Mike received the blow on the head? Was the coroner able to check that? I don't think he's tried, Mr. Dollar. Well, have him do it, would you please, if he can? Well, sure. Also, I'll do have... me a favor and check with lawyer Guilford. I'd like to know when he's coming out here with a will. Oh, I saw him just a few minutes ago, and he asked me to tell Buster. Sometime this afternoon, if he can get away. Good, thanks. I'll talk to you later. Well, sure, Mr. As I started to say, Mr. Dollar, Look, Miss I... Woodbury, there is nothing that you or any of us can do until we get the complete report from the coroner. Well, you can at least tell us what you meant And when what you about meant... dear Uncle Michael's will, Mr. Dollar? That will have to wait for the attorney. He expects to be here sometime later today. Now, wait a minute. You said murdered. Incidentally... I suppose the will shouldn't be read until uh, Lolita, or whatever her name is, gets here. According to her telegram, she ought to get here today. Well, she'd better. What I want you to do is arrange for quarters here. And uh, all of you stay here. If you won't do it of your own free will, I'll have Chief Harding of the Kingman Police Department take whatever... No. No. Such a humiliation is entirely unnecessary. There's nothing to keep me from sticking around. I want to hear that world, too. Of course. Don't we all? Okay, then. Sit tight. For my money, any one of them could have done it. A toxicologist, a man whose business was handling poisonous reptiles, and a cheap tin horn gambler, and the nightclub dancer who hadn't appeared yet. Yeah, any one of them. The latch onto the old man's fortune. I avoided telling the three present about the circumstances of their uncle's death and the hope one of them would slip would give himself away by saying something to show that he or she already knew. As soon as they were ensconced in their rooms, Buster and I hopped into his outboard and headed up the lake. Remember the last time we rode up here looking for evidence, Johnny? Yeah, I sure do. That was the Midas Touch mine. Yeah. And a pretty little lady owned a high-power rifle with a scope sight. Just about here, she started taking pot shots at us from the shore. Well, that's one thing we won't have to worry about this trip. Now, right around this point is where I found Mike's boat on the beach. And like I told you, 
And I may have overlooked some clue that you'll spot in a second. Buster. Yeah? Tell me, did old Mike earn enough as a fishing guy to make a living? Well, just about enough to buy food and a few odds and ends and... Well, like I told you, most of the time he deliberately forgot to charge. Not needing the money and all. Hey, Johnny. There in the cove. What? A boat. Right where Mike was. Whose is it? Do you know? Isn't out of our landing by... Hey, that's up the smoke from behind the bush way up on the sand dune. Swing us around. That's somebody with a gun. And look, we're taking in water, those holes in the bottom. Grab that can and start bailing. Hey, that guy can shoot. Pull us around, Buster. We're like a pair of sitting ducks out here. Right. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. Democracy. It takes an awareness of life and a respect for mankind to make democracy work. But when this happens, democracy works in mysterious ways to better the lives of everyone. Why? Because democracy is concerned with everyone. One could say that democracy is people. For the people rule themselves in a democracy. No tyrant stands a chance. No dictator can get a foothold. The systems of laws and justice in a democratic government is made and operated by the people, for the people. And people like to be free. That's why democracy gives mankind its finest legacy of freedom. Now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Kirby Will Matter. Whoever had been shooting at us from the shore there in Lake Mojave had a good eye. But a 30-mile-an-hour outboard at over 200 yards and swerving like mad can be a pretty tough target. With a hull full of holes, we had no choice but to go back to the landing. There, I made a quick check of the three I suspected of having killed old Mike Kirby. First, his nephew, Chester. Right here in my room, Mr. Dollar, reading. Then a brief walk in the hills. Why? And when is that lawyer coming to read Uncle Michael's will? Then the niece, Martha Woodbury. Gathering a few desert plants, as you must know. Hardly racing about on the lake armed with a gun, as you seem to suspect. Why don't you question Henry? If anyone should know how to handle a gun, he should. So I question Hank Kirby. Patient, that's what. I saw no reason to just sit around waiting for that lawyer to arrive. I was fishing in that first big cove on the right. On the Arizona side. That's right. And I saw you and Buster tearing back here. That's when I come back to see what was up. Now, what is up? Mr. Kirby? Yeah, yeah Buster? On the pay phone, the phone booth next to the cafe. Yeah? Kingman operator just called. Yeah? She still hadn't been able to reach your party on whatever that call was you made. Oh, yeah, thanks. What call, Hank? Uh, well, I, I've been trying to locate Lita and find out why she hasn't got down here. Maybe she doesn't care about the will. Where is she, Hank? It was to a dive up in Las Vegas that I sent the telegram, Johnny. Yeah, 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 that's where she's been working. Is that where you called earlier, Hank? Earlier? Yeah, didn't I see you in that phone booth when Buster and I pulled out? Oh, yeah, sure, trying to get Lita then, too. Yeah. Yeah, it reminds me, Johnny. Lawyer Guilford just phoned me from Kingman. He'll be over here in about an hour. Then the will gets read, huh? Perhaps we ought to wait for Lita. What do you think, Hank? She'll, she'll be... Well, did you talk to her? Is she on her way? Yes, yeah, she's on her way. All right. If Buster's willing, we'll use the office when Gilford gets here. Sure. So, Hank, you tell the others to be ready and waiting. Yeah, sure thing. Come on, Buster. All right, Johnny. What's on your mind? Well, maybe it's just a hunch, nothing more. But I want to get on that phone in the office. I called Armand College first. Yes, Miss Martha Woodbury had left there only last night. So she couldn't have been here when Mike Kirby was killed. A call to Chester's Hangout, a private gambling club in Reno, indicated the same thing. Call number three was to the so-called museum, where Hank Kirby worked with the snakes, a place within easy driving distance of Lake Mojave. But the records showed he hadn't left the place in two weeks until this present trip to be here. Lolita? Well, the manager of the club in Las Vegas said she hadn't missed a show. Daytimes? Well, who knew? But she was there every night. Then I suddenly remembered something about the geography of Lake Mojave. 
Here, Johnny. Cottonwood Landing is only about 25 miles north on the west, the Nevada side of the lake. Could that boat we saw in the cove? Sure. That's where it came from. I knew there was something familiar about it. Hey, what are you going to do, Johnny? Hangman. Operator, get me Cottonwood Landing, please. Yes, sir. One of their rental boats, Johnny. Yes, sir, I'm sure of it. Any number? Any identification on it? All that I didn't see. Anyhow, they rent so many to fishermen every day. Uh-huh. Hey, here comes Lawyer Guilford driving up. Good. Cottonwood. Hello, this is Johnny Dollar, special investigator. Yes, sir. What... I want to know if you rented a boat today to a girl named Lolita Laverne. Laverne? I'll meet him, Johnny, and I'll bring him all in here. Okay. Uh, no, sir, uh, nobody by that name rented today. Well, uh, what about Friday? Friday afternoon. Friday. Yeah, that's right. Uh, well, the only women we rented to on Friday was old lady Newberry, down from Canada for a couple of days. No, this is a young girl. Well, the other was a Miss Hancock. Hancock? Lucy Hancock. Okay, thanks very much. I've never seen... Johnny, this is Lawyer Gilbert. Lawyer, Mr. Johnny Dollar. It's a pleasure, Mr. Dollar. How are you, sir? Now, if, if you'll all please sit down... Uh, I'm a little pressed for time, so I'll waste none in getting to the reading of Michael Kirby's will. Well, you you don't think we ought to wait for Lita to get here? It it won't be necessary. No. Uh, No. I I possess a full accounting of the net value of Mr. Kirby's estate. Excellent. It it may surprise you, by the way. Fine, fine. This will confirms that valuation. It is dated, by the way, just five months ago. Made it out right after. Oh, look, let's get to the well. Huh? Let's read it. Yes, yes, come please, on. Please. His real property consisted only of his clothes, then the outboard motorboat, and an old car which he transferred to the Lake Mojave Resort, together with a sum of money to provide for his living here. How much? Yeah. Only $10,000. Oh, well, good. Uh, Some years ago, he turned all other of his real property, including some rather important real estate and business holdings, into cash. Well, where is all the cash deposited now? Surely you aren't considering adding bank robbery to your rather questionable career, Henry. Martha, that is quite uncalled for. Now, why don't we proceed with the will? Yeah. Uh, There is one asset specifically set aside that perhaps I should mention since it concerns Mr. Dollar. He is the beneficiary? Oh, no, 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 no. I refer to the insurance policy for five thousand dollars. Well, don't worry about a piddling amount like that. Let's have the will, oh, man. Get on, get on. The insurance policy is to cover burial expenses and nothing else. All of it is to be used. Okay, okay. Let's have the rest of the world. Yes. And to leave all that uh, out. Very well. Uh, <clears throat> I, Michael Jonathan Kirby, do make ordain. And declare this instrument to be my last will and testament. Oh, why don't you skip that stuff? Please. Being of sound mind and body, determined to enjoy the fruits of an industrious life to the fullest. The bequests, man. Life to the fullest. And rather than burden others with the responsibility that money demands. What? For these and other reasons... I have carefully spent every dollar I ever owned. <laughs> what? What? No, he was out of his mind. I couldn't do that. I told you so. That is the will of Michael Jonathan Kirby in its entirety. Good day. Good day. <laughs> what fools we've made of ourselves. What fools. And it's no less than we deserve. I only wish that Lucy had been here. Wait a minute. Lucy? Yes, Lucy. A real name, a proper name, not Lolita Laverne. It's Lucy Hancock Woodbury. But as I told you before... Now listen, all of you. You're to stay right here. Stay in your rooms. Oh? What's the point? Now we know the contents of that stupid will. Yeah. By what right, Chief Harding? Tell him to stand by in case these people get itchy feet. Right. What little I'd done so far in this case was based on nothing but hunches. So when 10, then 11 p.m. came and Lolita, Lucy Hancock Woodbury, hadn't arrived, I acted on another hunch. Sure, Johnny. My room is right next door to the office, so if this leader arrives and signs in, I'll let you know right away. No, Buster, no. Huh? Just sign her into a room after you've done a little tampering with the register. What do you mean? Chester is in number six, isn't he? 
That's right. All right. Change that on the register to number eight. That's this one, your room. That's right. And be sure that Lita sees the register. I don't understand. You don't have to, Buster. Let's just hope she gets here. Buster left. And with my door ajar, I turned off the light and lay on the bed and waited. It must have been after midnight when I heard the car pull in. I heard Buster admit someone to a room a couple of doors down the line and then go back to his own. Then, silence. Then, the quiet click of feminine footsteps approaching my door. Quickly, in the darkness, I lit a cigarette, held the glowing end away from my face. Well, darling. Yeah, about time. And about time you got some sense, Chet. No, no, don't turn on the light. The others are asleep. Their rooms are dark. Uh-huh. Listen, dear cousin, have you lost your mind? Mm. Shooting at that boat from over the ridge between the two coves. What were they? Police? Detectives? Hmm. You, you should have known you couldn't have hit them that far away, Chet. You should have waited till they got on shore looking for me. Well. Did they fall for the rattlesnake bite we made on the old man? Uh-huh. Well, they'll never find the needle I used. It's at the bottom of the lake. And look, if the cops question you, I hope you had sense enough to remind them what Martha and Hank do for a living. No chance. <laughs> and what about the will? <laughs> Would you be surprised? What? Say that again, Chet. Say anything. You sound like somebody else. Yeah, like Johnny Dollar. Let's have some light. Dollar? That's right, special investigator. Oh, no. Let me out of here. No, where do you think you're going? No, let me go. Yeah, all four of them had wanted to see old Mike dead. But Hank, the only honest working man of the lot, didn't have the brains. Martha wouldn't have used a means that tied in with her toxicology work and probably didn't have the nerve. So Chet, who lived by his wits, and Lita, who was a real cheap, no account, well, the courts will take good care of them. And I still have to chuckle over poor old Mike's will. Being of sound mind, I have spent all my money. <laughs> Which reminds me, Expense account total, including transportation back to Hartford, three thirty one twenty five. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week. Well, next week, the most complicated case in years comes up with the simplest, most obvious solution. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Barney Phillips, Shirley Mitchell, Stacey Harris, Carlton Young, Forrest Lewis, Frank Nelson, and John Vayner. Musical supervision is by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. <laughs>